All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we're here today to do the trauma nursing uh, assessment and interventions. This is kind of a course that hopefully prepares you in case you're gonna do a, a regular trauma course. Uh, one of the ones out there that makes it a little bit easier uh, if you've never taken it before, or if you're in a situation where um, this is, um, Case where can anybody, I guess, give me a thumbs up. Can you guys hear the dinging that when everybody joins on your side, or is it just on mine? Awesome. <laughs> All right. As we get forward, quick uh, going through the disclaimers. Basically, this review course doesn't really give you any new superpowers. You guys are already awesome as it is. Um, this really, the course isn't endorsed by anybody at this point. Um, doesn't replace a, a real trauma course. I do a lot of the, the TNCC courses. We do ENPC courses. This is kind of just an introduction to get your feet wet to see what uh, you're in store for. For those of you that have taken the cor courses before, this may be a little bit of a refresher uh, for you. Everything here is based on um, uh, things that my experiences, observation, research that I've done, you know, bad ideas, things that, you know, I could have done better and I hopefully have learned from. Uh, make sure again, this isn't, you know, here to supersede your hospital policy, state laws or anything else. You make sure that, you know, you leave being able to do pretty much the same things you came in able to do. Um, when we go in, just a quick, who are we? Um, Northwest Health Services is a training company based out of, right outside of Portland, Oregon. We do most of the usual courses, ACLS PALS, all the typical alphabet kind of things that are out there. Uh, we also end up, um, we do a lot of uh, specialty courses where we go through and uh, customize. One of the ones that we've been doing is difficult airway type courses. Uh, there's one that we just put on a live broadcast a couple of weeks ago, salad, which was suction assisted uh, laryngoscopy and airway decontamination, one really for, for paramedics where dealing with the super contaminated airway. We also do work with point of care ultrasound as well as protected code and airway. The ones that we're most proud of is we've been doing since the ENA opened it up uh, around six weeks ago, doing the virtual TNCC courses and now starting ENPC. So making it easier for folks to do their entire TNCC program online uh, all the way through the written test. And so we're doing right now about three to six TNCC courses a week. And so if you have, you know, this is a shameless plug for the, or what we do is if you have folks that need those courses, uh, we're doing them. And I mean, we're offering them, we've got, Courses right now we're scheduling where we're doing them for uh, nurses that are in Kandahar. So the courses are running pretty strong at that. We've got some really good instructors. Um, when you go through, this is a little bit quick about me, just some of the things my interest as far as from ultrasound. We do a course called the Protected Airway and Code, which we started doing back in January before all this craziness with COVID came around. And we ended up uh, with that, uh, really, it's a case where we ended up starting doing a lot of the courses to test out and see, you know, if you put PPE on, there's really no way to tell how, how well it's working or how well you're doing. You know, you either come down with something or you don't. And so we've tried to make the things like the glow germs where folks can be able to see, you know, what does my PPE do? Does it work? And, um, help them learn from, you know, mistakes here that are not going to cost somebody their life. Uh, this is kind of my view from my side. Uh, this is what I'm seeing. This is kind of a typical day for me is in teaching the courses. So this is, um, this is kind of a little bit of an extension. We're trying it out. We've been doing some free courses just during all this COVID stuff to try to help folks. In the future, we will be offering continue education. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, we hope to be able to offer some of those to folks that may not be able to get out. 
when we come through, this is my contact information. I'll show it again at the at the end. If you guys are on Twitter, uh, Twitter's a great place to learn. I'm probably on Twitter too much. Uh, feel free to add me if you're on Twitter. We post a lot of things out there and a lot of good content. When we go through and start thinking about why we're here today, it's really to try to get folks thinking about trauma and the process of evaluating trauma. When we do our other classes, we really are training folks on a process to go through and work a trauma so that they address the priorities. A lot of times, you know, this is uh, one of the facilities that I work in. I pull anywhere from one to three shifts a month still in the emergency department, small critical access hospital, you know, may go days or weeks without seeing trauma. And then you may get things, you know, dropped in your lap. So you kind of have to be ready to go at a, at the moment's notice, but there's a lot of, of downtime in between. You go to some larger facilities and they've got preset as far as their fluids, their part lines, everything's set up. They're ready to go at a moment's notice for those. And they're for them, you know, two car collision with, you know, two or three patients. For me and when I'm out in the critical access hospital working, it's, it's probably, you know, we're gonna be busy as can be and swamped. For a major trauma center, that might just be a slow um, Wednesday morning. So just some different perspectives. When we do the classes and what we encourage folks to, to think about is kind of go with the least common denominator. From working in large trauma centers, we've had cases where folks are used to having a lot of resources <clears throat> and throwing at the problem. So if you've got you know, typically if you call a trauma in a teaching hospital, you end up with every med student within three zip codes around you that descend on the trauma. So we try to make sure, you know, in, when we train, if you can manage in a very resource limited situation, I've worked in ERs before in rural areas where the ER provider is a local family physician that is out in the community. He comes over and sees patients. He goes home at night and the nurse and the CNA has whatever comes in the door, probably for the first 20 to 30 minutes. Um, one of the facilities that I work with now, <clears throat> nighttime, you may have just a single nurse. Um, you may have a CNA, just a physician or a PA that covers the ER. You might have one or two nurses on the floor, maybe one or two CNAs, but you're nowhere near uh, resource uh, loaded. So I would say that think about those things when you go through these courses and if you can manage it in very um, resource limited environments, when you do get those resources, you'll be much better prepared for it. The, the courses in that we do and, and what you're training for is really kind of to be able to set your priorities, to make sure that we're addressing the things that's going to kill this patient the quickest. You know, that's where we come in with the ABCs. We'll talk about that as we go through it, that those things are, are there so that we address the priority first and the next priority so that we're working our way down that list. Um, when we do that, that's going to help us organize our care better, but that's also going to uh, allow us to give better care to the patient and be able to address those critical issues as we come on them. In your, in your emergency department, you're basically going to get patients one of two ways. Uh, you're, they're going to come in either as a patient that comes in to, through your waiting room or through your ambulance bay that shows up on your doorstep unannounced, untriaged, undifferentiated. A uh, good example, I think I, if I remember correctly, in the case of the Pulse nightclub shooting, from the time the first shot went off, that ER received 26 patients at their front door in 26 minutes. So that's enough to put a strain on pretty much anybody's emergency department. That's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm pretty religious about when I come on shift, making sure I go through, test out all my equipment, make sure that my suction's hooked up and running, that everything's good, because I want to be ready for that patient. Even if, if I have a shift where I, I see minimal patients, I have the peace of mind knowing something that lands on my doorstep, I'm going to be able to address. The other patients that we get are going to be the patients that get 
basically brought in with some number of ETA from EMS. Those are going to be the patients that you get the benefit in these cases of uh, they've done some of the upfront work for us, they've started the process, and they've transported the patient. If you have the opportunity and you want to take your really your, your nursing trauma skills to the next level, and once you do courses like TNCC, I always advise folks to try, you know, find the National Association of EMTs put out a course that's called um, Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support. Excellent course because it we're used to getting our patients kind of pre-packaged and, and presented to us. Whereas with these patients, you may have your scenario be the patient's upside down in the ditch in a pool of vomit. When we do our on-site courses, that's one of the things that we spend a little bit of time on, depending on the facility, is actually working with nurses on, on doing some extrication from the vehicles. You don't always have an EMS unit sitting out front in a lot of cases, or EMTs, paramedics, or firefighters to help. So that patient that pulls up at your ambulance bay that's, that's beeping the horn that all of a sudden, you know, they fell off their ladder at home, their spouse drove them in, and now they're numb and tingling down in their legs. So how do we extract those patients out? How do we safely get them in? Um, the other course that's a good course to take is the physician's version of TNCC, and it's the one Advanced Trauma Life Support. Most of the teaching hospitals, if you go on the American Academy of Surgeons, you can find those courses in your area. And a lot of times they'll let nurses um, audit those courses for either very, you know, no money or for a very, you know, reasonable fee. So $100 or $200 in that range. And you'll get a lot of great knowledge, plus you'll get a lot of, of hands-on time with these things. And so it's definitely worth the, when you go, no matter how you get the patient, one of the things to look at is getting yourself ready. You know, some of that readiness is kind of beyond, you know, we all know that we're gonna activate our trauma system. So we're gonna definitely start mobilizing resources. That might be, you know, if you're in a major facility, everybody's pager goes off and you have everybody in your facility waiting within five minutes. In some facilities, this may be that, you know, your nurse anesthetist is at home, 20, 30 minute call back. You may not have x-ray or lab in-house, depending on what time of the day it is. So you've got to, you have to plan on these things. So that's kind of one of the first things is start getting help rolling. Once you get the help rolling is start thinking about briefing the team as they show up. What do we know so far? What does this sound like? And start from there planning the care, you know, plan and assign the care for folks that um, try to organize things so that when that patient does land on your doorstep, you know, you're ready. Uh, the next thing to do is basically is really take care of yourself. You've got to be in the right mindset, you know, make sure you're your bowels and bladder are all good because you, who knows how long you're going to be in this. And that's one additional stressor on your body that you don't need to worry about is, you know, over in the corner crossing legs or, or pacing when these things could be taken care of up front. So that's one of the ones that we really, you know, advise folks to, you know, take care of yourself, get a sip of water. Um, finally, before the patient, you know, arrives is take a deep breath, take several. You know, get yourself in the right mindset so that when that patient does get to you, that you're ready for it. The next thing is, is really figuring out how to go from unprepared for that patient um, to being prepared. You know, some of this is upfront thought process. Some of it's going to be standard for any trauma patient that you're going to receive. You know, making sure that you've got that room warm, that you've got... Um, warm fluids there, you've got a bear hugger at bedside, you may have pulled out the under blanket for the bear huggers and put on the patient. You may have also um, specialty equipment that you might need. You know, prepare your team, making sure everybody's on the same page, roles are assigned. In some cases, you may have a very small team. On some traumas, it's myself and, and a CNA and a physician. So there's not a lot of delegation that goes on there. It's like everybody wears a lot of hats. Make sure you address special equipment. 
uh, special equipment might be the case where as we go through the items that you want to pull out. So if you've got a pregnant and OB patient, pull those items out. If you've got a PEDS patient, have your Braslow tape out, have your PEDS cards. Make sure that you're ready to, uh, for any special things that, that occur. When we go forward, um, make sure lastly that you and your team are all in PPE. You wanna make sure that everybody is set, ready to go, and that as you're as the patient comes in, you're going to be prepared. In the new COVID world that we're dealing with, this is a case where, you know, we kind of have to go overkill on some of these because we really don't know. Um, it's not really those patients I'm really afraid of a lot of times that, you know, for COVID, it's the ones that are that come in that you don't know, that are undifferentiated. And they've, they've came in with pretty much, I heard one story of somebody came in, had a bike accident turned out to be COVID positive in New York. So it's almost at a point where we kind of think about, you know, every patient that comes in as a potential COVID. Once you get everything squared away, you end up um, waiting for the patient. That's that pause, kind of that, everybody takes a breath, waiting for the patient to come in. When you do, when that patient does get there, one of the things to do is basically take a look and you want to do that across the room look on the patient. You want to try to figure out, you know, the one question that you're trying to answer looking across the room is, is there any uncontrolled external hemorrhage? That's the biggest thing that, that you look at and really, you know, care about at that point is, uh, is there anything there? Because that's what's going to end up uh, killing that patient. Um, one of the things that, you know, we get all the time when we do classes is why, you know, I can remember my first paramedic exam. We had a patient that the scenario was the patient had exsanguinating hemorrhage that the patient was bleeding out, but the thought was get to the airway, manage that airway. So it's taken a little bit of, of change of thought over the years to really prioritize that, try to keep the stuff inside. When we look at it, one of the big reasons is that hemorrhage that we're seeing is that's one of the most preventable causes of death in the trauma patient just by doing that keeping the red stuff on the inside uh, looking at that patient figuring out you know where's this external hemorrhage coming from a lot of times it can be it can be deceptive you know if you haven't seen somebody bleed to death from a scalp injury scalp wound you know you probably have been led a pretty lucky life or, or haven't been doing this long enough those patients do bleed to death from scalp injuries where you may be, one of the first things you may be doing before anything else is having your provider grab a stapler, slamming some staples into it and taping everything shut. So this, it's just a matter of, of trying to figure this out. A lot of times the occult bleeding, the hidden stuff is what really gets us. So those patients that end up, you know, you roll them and all of a sudden you realize, my gosh, there's, you know, a liter of blood that's soaked into the, the towels underneath the patient, or they've ended up, um, you know, they've been slowly oozing from this venous leaker that's back behind them. So keep those in mind. That's the biggest uh, thing that, you know, really concerns. And that's one of the biggest areas where we can have an impact. The quicker we can get those areas under control, the better. When we look at blood, as far as it goes, we don't really have a whole lot of blood. You know, you think about a person who's 70 kilos, they don't have a lot of, of extra blood to spare. You know, I probably, five liters, I probably drink that much Diet Mountain Dew in a couple of days. And so that's not a, that volume of stuff is pretty, it's pretty precious to that patient. You look at the case of a child, a 30 kilo child, about 1,800 to 24. So basically, essentially a two liter bottle soda size of blood. So if they lose that, you know, and it's, that's even losing 200 cc's, 300 cc's has a big impact. So something to be aware of in trying to conserve these things. When you get into your assessment, so we've looked across the room and normally we're used to doing an assessment on somebody where we go through our A's, our B's, our C's, our D's and our E's and we address things, you know, that's our priority. 
airway is going to kill you before breathing. Breathing is going to kill you before, you know, circulation. Now, as long as you're not exsanguinatingly hemorrhaging out. Um, what do we do, though, if all of a sudden this patient is in this situation, they're exsanguinatingly hemorrhaging? We don't run to the airway at that point. Um, one of the things we end up doing is we reprioritize. We then go through and we address all of our circulation issues. It's not just, you know, we'll throw a tourniquet on it and let's move on to the airway. The circulatory portion of this is so important. We're doing the entire circulation. So we go through everything that we would normally do under circulation. As we do that, we get control of the hemorrhage, we stop it. We palpate for a central pulse. We look at color, temperature, and moisture. We do these things basically to determine if this patient appears shocking. When you go through some of the courses, the, the trauma ones like this, you one of the first things we typically do is throw blood pressure monitors and try to get them on the uh, bedside monitor and pulse ox and all those things. When you take these type of courses like you know TNCC, PHTLS, other courses, you really your resuscitation strategy initially is driven by things that you can do with what you've got in your hands right now. You know, palpate that central pulse. Is it thready? You know, we know that in the past we used to think, gosh, you know, if they've got a radial pulse, I've got probably an 80 or 90 blood pressure. That tended to overestimate the blood pressure. So I'm trying to feel, you know, central pulse. I'm looking maybe for a peripheral. I don't know exactly what that number is for each individual, but I do know that as their pressure drops, they're going to lose their radial. They're going to lose their brachial. They're going to lose their femoral. And finally, they're going to lose their carotid. I can treat them based on that, knowing that if all of a sudden I've got a weak, thready, carotid, maybe an absent radial brachial, I need to really get on the ball and start doing resuscitation, trying to preserve things. Um, things that we also look at, skiller, uh, skin color, temperature, and moisture. We want to make sure that we're assessing those. I can assess that patient and determine if they're in shock way quicker than anybody can cycle a non-invasive blood pressure. And so you're able to do that more continually. Um, you also, you know, just the fact of knowing they're in shock, you need to be able to do something about it. So if they've got IVs, check their patency. If they don't have IVs, let's get some going. Let's get IOs going. Let's get some sort of access where we can give fluids. Um, after that, we're going to basically, when we have access, we're going to start bolusing. Typically, we're going to be starting with crystalloids. The trend is really to decrease the amount of crystalloids. I know any number of trauma surgeons that would be happy to get rid of crystalloids and, and have just whole blood there from a resuscitation standpoint. So it's, it's something to you know, know your facility. In some places, you, know, you may not have ready access to packed cells or, or whole blood, so it may take some time. Those are cases you, know, you have to work with what you've got, but again, trying to limit the crystalloids that we're, we're dumping in. In past years, I can remember working traumas where we had dumped, you know, three liters or while we're waiting on blood, four liters of crystal. And you end up in a case where you're just, the patient starts draining out just um, basically cherry Kool-Aid, just loose, I mean, fluids running out of them from every orifice. And so that that has a lot of implications on not only their clotting, but their, their hypothermia. So it's, it's definitely something that we want to try to avoid. Now, if we're doing our assessment in most of the traumas we're going to see, probably the case is going to be where we don't have to reprioritize. We don't have any uncontrolled external hemorrhage. We're fine going through and doing our A, Bs, and Cs. But just remember that in those cases, if we need to, if that's if there's exsanguinating hemorrhage, we need to do those. Um, that becomes more important than anything else we can do for that patient. So the next thing we look at is we need some way to tell the patient's mental status. We need to see, as part of their airway, we do an AVPU, alert, verbal, pain, and unresponsive. And we do that to kind of give ourselves an idea of, from an airway perspective, how how able are they to maintain their own airway? Uh, are they in a case where we need to intervene quickly on them? Or is it a case where, you know, they're alert, talking, 
you know, uh, the further they move to the right, the more you've got to be concerned about their airway. And that's why, you know, really following these patients, make sure that we're, you know, reassessing them as we go uh, so that they do start slipping. You know, as you see a patient go from the first stage of shock compensated into uh, a decompensated shock, you're going to start seeing some changes where you, that patient that was maybe a little bit slow alert, now all of a sudden, you know, it's taking verbal uh, stimulation to get them to wake up. Maybe it's starting to take pain. There comes a point there when they're going to slide so far to the right, they're not going to be able to manage their airway. So we've got to know and prepare for those things. Once we get the, the AVPU down, we need to try to manage their cervical spine. So we need to gain control of it. Um, to getting the cervical spine under control, if they, it's a time for us to take a second and, you know, one, does this patient have a mechanism that we may need to consider cervical spine? Number two, if they've got cervical spine immobilization on, is it appropriately placed? And that's an area where we need to, you know, I don't know how many times I see collars, not quite this bad as far as placement, but pretty bad on occasion and just haven't been sized appropriately. The patient's chin's down, you know, in this area. So make sure you, as you look at these, uh, this is a good time to, to take note of this. If not, you know, have your coworker hold C-spine immobilization and apply the collar correctly or get the appropriate size ones. So this is an area that, you know, in everything we do, the, the airway takes precedent over the C-spine, but hopefully we don't get into a situation where we have to make that, that decision. Once we get the C-spine under control, if the patient is able to, if they're conversant with us, we can ask them, open your mouth. Um, they can either do that. If not, if they've got this on, we need one of our coworkers to take, open the front flap of the C collar, hold C-spine immobilization, and we need to do a jaw thrust. What we wanna do is we wanna basically look in here, okay? When we start doing our airway assessment, we're gonna go in and you basically want to look, listen, and feel. You know, so I'm gonna be looking for, is there any vomit? Is there any secretions? Is there any loose or missing teeth? Are there any dentures, partials, anything like that? Um, you never know when you're looking in there sometimes what you're gonna end up seeing. So you have to be prepared for that. And one of the worst things that I can, I can think of to look into somebody's airway and find is chew. That's got to be the worst thing as far as for clearing out airways. I just imagine these folks having terrible pneumonias and pneumonitis after that. So that's kind of part of the look. Now, when we start listening, listening is pretty straightforward because there's only a certain number of things that we're going to hear. Okay. If I hear strider, then this patient's going to probably get a tube or a scalpel. Okay, because we've got to have that airway either from above or below, we've got to manage it. Um, that's one of the things that, you know, we can't go further, we can't uh, continue until we can get this addressed. And so this could be the patient that has clothesline injury, it could be a patient with expanding hematomas to the neck. We've got to have an airway plan in place to think about how we're going to deal with this you know, and a lot of times it's really only got two choices. It's an endotracheal tube or it's a, a needle or surgical crike. Uh, these type of things don't lend themselves well to being fixed by, by LMAs and by king tubes. Um, so that's kind of a, a something that uh, needs to be looked at and addressed. Um, if it gurgles, it gets suctioned. Okay, so we've got to clear it out. We've got to remove the secretions. So strider gets a, a tube or a scalpel. If it gurgles, it gets suctioned. A lot of times your gurgling uh, can be something. I mean, you not only have to fix, clean out the whatever's causing them to gurgle, but gurgling is the enemy of any kind of airway management. I do a lot of difficult airway courses, intubation courses for, for paramedics, uh, We've done this one course salad where we've done it, you know, pretty much all over the, the country on that. This is actually, we, I did one of the fun things if you ever get a chance to do is I love uh, 
going to cadaver courses and I love teaching at cadaver courses. So there's, you can find some coming up. I think there's one that a um, gentleman down in Texas is doing coming up in Nashville, as long as everything gets, you know, opened up in the fall. This is one of the mannequins that we use. We switched over to this type of mannequin just because of the high fidelity. You're used to dealing with some of the, the plastic sim ones. This is probably one of the most realistic mannequins and it's a burned airway. And this mannequin actually will froth and, and spits up on you. So one of the things that, that we train folks on is the fact that the foam and everything else in their mouth is the enemy of your video laryngoscopy. You're not going to get very far with video laryngoscopy if you're having to keep cleaning your blade, pulling it out. So we teach in the salad courses, we teach leading with the um, suction catheter, clearing the airway as you go a couple, two centimeters ahead of it. And then once you get it cleared, parking that catheter in the esophagus to catch anything else that might try to come up at you. Um, so it's a great, this one is a, is a really hard mannequin. Um, Usually, even on a good day, it's it's hard to get like even a 6.0 ET tube in there. Um, so if it's got stuff in it, you clean it out. If it snores, it gets an OPA or an NPA, okay? Depending on if there's uh, facial trauma, if there's anything with uh, head injury concerns, we're going oral on this one. Uh, the only, the big contraindication on the oral airway is just the fact that you want to make sure that um, there's no gag reflex. Now, that's one of my one of my pet peeves when we teach, you know, basic maneuvers is, you know, when we get a patient and we we have somebody that all of a sudden we think, okay, I want to put an oral pharyngeal airway in this person. You know, they're they're snoring and you know we need to address that. Well, you want to test them and see if they've got a gag reflex. So how do we normally do it? We'll basically either put a wooden tongue depressor down their throat, or we'll just go straight to the oropharyngeal airway and try to drop that in. Now, if you stop back, step back and think about this, we've got somebody who's strapped, laying supine on a backboard or a stretcher. We're putting things into their mouth to try to make them vomit to see if we can put something else into their mouth. So that's a case where you know, I would really encourage you, instead of doing that, think about leading off with a suction catheter on it. That way, if you do stimulate them to vomit, you've got something to deal with. The practice we've been teaching is you have somebody who has an airway. This airway, basically, um, in the cases of it, they typically, back in this area, there's a cistern back here that where secretions collect, okay? We come along and one of the things you can do is those secretions collect back here. If I just go ahead and throw something on their mouth and I start bagging them, I'm going to basically spray this down their trachea into their lungs and I'm going to probably create a pneumonia or pneumonitis. Same is true if I just drop an oropharyngeal airway in, I'm going to cause probably the same problem. So one of the things, I mean, one thing that you can do is before you do it, put the suction catheter in suction everything back in the posterior oropharynx, that gives you a cleaner path when you do start ventilating them that you can get uh, air into their lungs without two to three days from now, them all of a sudden coming up with patchy infiltrates on their chest x-ray, and now all of a sudden they've got a nasty pneumonia or pneumonitis. One thing that we've learned and we've been teaching is instead of using kind of this standard maneuver here, is we turn the around and hold it like a laryngoscope. So that when we go in and suction, one of the things that you can do with that is just grab the base of the tongue and lift up and drop your oropharyngeal airway straight in, just like you were using a tongue blade. Um, and so it's a nice, you can do this. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do it with a yank hour just because the tip, it's a little bit more flexible, but this is a good way to put an oropharyngeal airway. I use that if I'm putting supraglottic or king tubes in also helps me lift up the tongue, keep it out of the way, and I'm then able to easily pass those other tubes. It's also, you know, prior to this, I've cleaned this area out, so it makes this go in far, far easier. When we look at starting, we get through airway, and when we get to airway, it's pretty simple 
your assessment steps. When we do, when we teach our classes, any basically any class, if you're assessing something, if you can just think about three items that you can do, you're, you're golden. Look, listen, and feel. So I look at I look at the breathing. What's their work of breathing? What's the chest excursion? Is there any paradoxical movements? Is there asymmetric movements to the chest? Trachea is at midline. Is there any JVD? Uh, going through, also looking, is there any deformities, bruising? The big thing that you're looking at, I mean, we're going to be looking at things like <clears throat> tension pneumothoraxes and things like that. But one of the more common things, and it's going to be probably the most frequent question that you're trying to ask yourself, you, you've got one of two paths that you need to be. You've got the proverbial for, fork in the road. What you're trying to decide on this patient is, are they in respiratory distress? Are they in respiratory failure? If they're in respiratory distress, we're going to see certain things. We're going to see to keep you increased effort, work. We're going to see retractions. As we go through that, that tells me they're in distress. So I can work with that. I know what to do for it. If I go through and I see that they've got slow, irregular respirations, shallow, dusky, and cyanotic, that tells me something different. I know that they're getting ready to probably have a respiratory arrest and possibly right after that have a cardiac arrest. So I want to start addressing those. It's pretty simple in the trauma patient. It's either respiratory distress or failure. If you're dusky or cyanotic, you're in failure. So we need to address that. So basically the, the treatments are pretty easy. If you're distressed, I give you lots of oxygen. I throw as much as I can throw at you, okay? If you're in failure, I bag you because your respirations, you're ineffective. You're either not moving an adequate amount, rate, or an adequate volume of air. So I need to do something to, to try to manage that. So I would end up bagging, assisting ventilations. And so that's something where, again, we can use our adjunct if we have an oropharyngeal airway in, that's a good adjunct to have to help us keep that open. Now, unfortunately, bagging patients and BVM is one of the most underrated skills in probably emergency medicine and critical care. When you look at people doing it, you know, there's dainty grips and everything, and there's, <clears throat> we tend to, every time that they do 50 country studies of how well that we do bag valve ventilation, we tend to always, we give too much volume and we give too fast of a rate. I mean, we get beat out probably by countries that are basically bagging somebody with some duct tape, a two liter soda bottle and some tennis shoe strings, you know, and some garden hose. They're doing better jobs than we are just because, you know, they don't give the excess volume. They don't do the rate. They keep their breaths down. One of the things that we know is that there's some things that will help. A lot of the folks out there still are using the EC technique. We've switched over based on recent studies to doing in our training classes um, for airways, we're teaching a, the two thumbs down method. The two thumbs down method basically gives you, instead of relying on your ring finger and your pinky to do the jaw thrust, you've got your hands on both sides of that mask allowing you to put good even pressure there and you're doing a jaw thrust lifting up into that mask. You'll notice off to the side over here another view of it and again you've got that middle and that ring finger grabbing behind the jaw and you're lifting that face up into the mask. So it gives you the studies have shown less gastric insufflation, better tidal volume delivery with less airway pressures. You know and we worry about airway pressures in doing these ventilations because the fact that as soon as you exceed about 21 centimeters of water pressure in the airway, you flip open the gastric sphincter and you start filling the belly up with air. That does a couple of bad things. That one restricts the excursion of the diaphragm down. So that makes it harder to ventilate this person. It reduces your volumes. You also provide propellant for whatever truck stop sushi they've had in the last three to four hours and I can pretty much guarantee you it will come back at you way quicker than it, than it went in. So it just puts your patient at risk for aspiration. 
we know that um, in these cases, this is a video, and I believe it was done by Rich Levitan, one of the large airway gurus. And this is, again, this is one of the benefits of doing things like cadaver labs. The, on this next video, you'll see that the patient, the cadaver's head is in a neutral position. And they're basically overbagging them. So they're overpressuring the lungs. They're not allowing. So look at how little the lungs move on this video. And look at how much the uh, stomach inflates. And again, that's just going to cause you volume problems and it's going to cause you aspiration problems. Poor technique with pressure, with aggressive two hand EVM use, um, significant stomach insufflation with inadequate lung ventilation. This big bubble of air is just waiting to come back and visit you very shortly. And so when it does, it's going to bring pretty much everything else that's down there back up with it. And so that's going to put your patient at risk for aspiration. That's going to put you at risk for having to go change your scrubs and your, uh, your PPE. So this is something to, to take note of. So when we get these patients like this, we get patients that were struggling to oxygenate. So Let's say that you know you go in, and this is this is a non-COVID patient. I'm sure everybody's heard about the saturations on COVID patients, and you know people sitting there at in the 50s, you know, texting on their phones. This would be maybe a saturation that, if you think about it, you know, if I come into your emergency room, I'm running this SAT. One of the first things you're probably going to do to try to fix my SAT is one, you're either going to try to spin the knob on the regulator and try to give me more oxygen. So if I came in on room air, you're probably going to be putting me on a non-rebreather. If I'm in a, on a ventilator in your ICU unit, um, you're probably going to be spinning the dials on the FiO2 to try to crank it up, you know, thinking of other things to try to get, you know, how to get my SATs up. You know, maybe also one that I'm a big fan of is positioning, you know, elevating the person, putting them at a 20 to 30 degree um, angle in the bed so that it makes it easier for them. It helps them breathe. This is especially too true if you've got the obese patient or the pregnant. Um, those, as long as their pressures will tolerate it, I pretty much got all of those. If they're, they're immobilized flat, I've got them in reverse Trendelenburg. You know, anybody who's been pregnant knows that, you know, if you're trying to breathe laying flat on your back and you're greater than 20 weeks, it's, it's not, you know, it's not an easy effort or an easy ordeal. So, Thing is, once I spin that dial, I put you at, there's no real setting on the vent. Like I want to give them turbo oxygen. I want to, I want 120% oxygen. So the question becomes is what's next? How do I get those sats up? How can I take in that person who's on the non-rebreather mask? And, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the eighties. I'm stuck, you know, when they're starting to spiral, what else can I do to try to get their sats up? One basic thing to do is the other thing that affects oxygenation is pressure. So if we apply some pressure to that individual, be it uh, have a PEEP valve on our bag valve mask, we use CPAP, BiPAP, or if they're on the vent, we, we turn the, the PEEP up on that. Those are things that we can get alveolar recruitment from. And that's, we're seeing that a lot with the COVID patients as far as, you know, the fact of their uh, initially, it seems like they've got very compliant lungs, so they'll respond to things like proning, um, whereas later they get maybe a little bit stiffer and harder to ventilate. The benefit of PEEP, this is another cadaver lab video that, you know, kind of shows you the, the, the recruitment. When we do recruitment, it basically expands these alveolar sacs that are sitting in the lungs. If they're collapsed, blood flow is just running past them. It's called a BQ mismatch or shunting. It goes by this collapse sac. No CO2 is dropped off, no oxygen is picked up, and it just keeps going right around and riding the circuit. What we want to do is expand those areas that increases the surface area for gas exchange. It also thins those membranes, making it easier for gases to move across. So this is a good one, just showing you the benefit of a PEEP in an a, a atelectatic uh, lung. This is a patient being bagged with atelectatic derecruited lung with no PEEP valve. A 
heat valve is applied, you can see over several breaths, the lung is inserted. The heat valve is turned up to 10, and the lung is maximally recruited. This gives you more safe apnea time and functional residual capacity. The heat valve is removed. You can see immediate heat recruitment and deflation of the lung. One of the things about that is that it takes more energy to open up the lung than it does really to keep it open. One of the things that damages some of these patients over periods of time is that open slam shut, open slam shut back and forth that damages those alveolar tissues and causes scarring and damage. Um, we're seeing now that, that folks that have very you know, sick patients that if you Essentially, you know, if you take them off the vent to put them to bag them, or if you take them from a transport vent to a hospital vent or vice versa, it takes, if they do, and they collapse those alveolar tissues, it takes a significant amount of time for them to recuperate from that. So I'm seeing a lot of reports out there of folks using like Kelly clamps and basically, you know, clamping, you know, mid-inspiration, clamping the tube, switching them from the vent, putting them on the bag valve. Now, you have to make sure that your bag valves have heap adapters on them. They're not quite as accurate or sensitive as the one on your vents, but at least it'll keep that lung tissue from uh, collapsing completely. And again, you, you're only doing it for a couple of seconds and then switching them over. It just keeps that, those lungs from, a move, from falling back to atmospheric pressure. In the COVID world, this is, is kind of what our bagging is looking like. I don't know if you know, if you are going to have to bag patients or non-undifferentiated patients, this is one of the things of, of making sure you've got one of those filters between your mask and the bag. This is a viral filter that basically will help some of that exhaled gas instead of coming out um, one of the exhaust areas over here. It basically flows through here and keeps traps those particles, or at least a majority of those particles in there, so it reduces the aerosolization of uh, ventilation. Now, if you're using these, you need to make sure with this in the peak valve, you don't break the seal of the mask. Every time you break the seal, that pressure drops back to zero, and you're kind of in the case where you have to start over on recruiting those lines. So in this case, they've got the PEEP adapter here. It's a good thing to check on your bags at work, and make sure that there is a PEEP adapter don't have one, you've eliminated a lot of your, one of your tools in the bag, a very important tool, as far as being able to get somebody sat up. And, you know, at some point or the other, you're going to have to take that patient potentially off the vent and bag them to get them up to the floor, to get them out to the helipad, things like that. And these folks can be sat. So, you know, look and see what your equipment is and know that uh, a lot of facilities I work with right now are pre-attaching on all their bag valve masks that are in the rooms are putting the viral filters on there just so it's ready and available. So we've covered breathing here. Let's cover, move into, next part is circulation. Circulation, again, you can, there's not a lot to listen to in circulation, but there's plenty of stuff you can look and feel. And again, if for some reason, let's suppose in our, our patient initially that we had had an uncontrolled external hemorrhage, we would have initially done our entire circulatory uh, piece of this up on the front end. And then when we get here, we're gonna redo the whole thing. That's how important it is. If you're ever in a trauma and you're wondering, what do I do next? Probably the right answer is check for uncontrolled external hemorrhage. That's the right answer. And that's probably gonna be, you know, we do it when we do some of the courses, you may, do it in the course of your assessment, primary and secondary, you may do it five or six times. And that's, that's how important it is. So when we do it, it's pretty straightforward. We check for uncontrolled external hemorrhage. We find it, we stop it. So we start thinking about, um, you know, places that venous leak or things that might be going on that, you know, we need to put a stop to. A lot of these little small cuts and things add up to blood loss. When again, palpate that central pulse. We can feel for peripherals to get a kind of a delta between the two. Uh, look at skin color, temperature, and moisture. Make sure, you know, any critical patient, trauma or not, you really want two good patent IVs. So you want to get those in 
uh, and established, maybe an IO, could be, you know, it's whatever you can get in. Um, and then bolus is indicated, at least, you know, most places, it's going to take a little bit of time to get blood there and you at least can start doing some things. Again, we're not going to bolus them to get them back normotensive. We're again, you know, going to be going for something, basically it's known as permissive hypotension, where we'll tolerate lower pressures to avoid doing things like popping the clot on these patients. So if we've got signs that the patient is shocky, one of the things we've got to ask ourselves is, where'd it go? If they lost blood. You know, a lot of times you'll be able to, to tell, you know, where the blood went to, either by the report or by, you know, looking around the room. You may be able to look externally and say, okay, I think I've got a pretty good idea where their, their blood volume, their circulating volume has went to. Um, one of the things that is a good saying, if you think about, you know, where can blood go to is blood on the floor and four more. Okay, so you're going, okay, I see the blood on the floor, but where's the four more? And that's some cavities, some areas in the body that you can lose a significant amount of blood. When you look at it, you know, the chest, abdomen, pelvis, and femurs, those things can lose, you know, those a tremendous amount of blood. And one of the issues that can come along with that is that especially if you've got somebody who is anticoagulated, you know, their pelvises by themselves are pretty much um, massive losses, even on someone that's not on Coumadin. Even being on aspirin is going to predispose you to having a fairly massive loss. The abdomen, pelvis, femurs, hopefully you're going to catch this as part of your, in the circulatory. This is another time that if we're in the circulatory phase, if I've got somebody who's shocky, you know, they're giving them fluid bolus, they may not be responding to them. This is an area to consider um, going through and doing a fast exam, trying to localize, find where that blood could be going and try to figure out a strategy. You know, once you kind of have an idea of where the blood is going, then you can start, you know, uh, planning as far as, you know, where'd the patient lose the blood at? So, you know, in this case, uh, there's only a few large body cavities that can happen in. Some of the things that we can do for this patient to help minimize some of those losses. One is if it's external hemorrhage, we put tourniquets on. If one doesn't work, we put a second one above it. Um, other things is, you know, trying to start warm crystalloids, at least until we can get some sort of blood product. If your facility, it's getting, it's been hard in the past to get whole blood. You know, ideally we replace like with like. What they lost is what they get. Um, in the case of a lot of facilities, they may not be able to. It's, unfortunately, whole blood was kind of fractionated down because it's worth more for the individual pieces of it than it is as a whole. So this is one of the things that, you know, we're starting to see now places, even helicopter programs, EMS services. Are starting to have access to it. You know, if you don't, you kind of have to, you know, give what you've got. There's definitely um, the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratios of one unit pack cells, one unit plate, what's one unit plasma to try to do it. There's some other interesting things, freeze-dried plasma, which gives you, that's been a hard one because of the shelf life on it, gives you a two-year shelf life uh, for it so that you can administer it once you reconstitute it. Um, other things to do is, uh, Beyond that, you know, the whole blood pelvic binders. This is a case where if you are in a trauma, um, a lot of times if, I'm, if I get a patient or if I picked up a patient that has an injury that might be consistent with a pelvic injury, I'm going to go ahead and put a binder on them. That's a, a good way to conserve uh, blood, to help the formation of clot, to stabilize injuries. Um, and so this is one thing to think about. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the different types of pelvic binders shortly. Um, other things to think about, transexamic acid. That's another one. Basically, it's good for most things that bleed. If the patient has been, the quicker you can get it on board, the better. I almost wish that it came in like an EpiPen that could just be injected in the field. Uh, usually it's about three to four hours is the, um, the thing is the time frame that you get the best effect. They've had some good uh, studies recently came out about with uh, traumatic brain injuries of using TXA with that 
and especially in patients that may not, you know, have the catastrophic, you know, the person with the GCS of four or five, but somebody with the GCS of uh, say 11 or 12, where they get some significant benefit from it. So those are good studies that I think we'll, we'll see more data coming out. Other things that might be in here, depending on your facility, is uh, Reboa, um, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. It's basically a balloon that goes up your femoral artery, parks itself in the aorta, inflates, and it's not a bridge, it's not a, a, like a destination, it's more, it's gonna buy you an hour to an hour and 15 minutes until you can be in the OR. So some of the rural areas I go to, you know, there's, there's no way that that would even have a place there at this point. They are working on some balloons that have, you know, once you inflate the balloon, the clock starts ticking. So there's new balloons they're working on that have flow through ability as well as they have protocols they're, they're trying of like, you know, up for 10 minutes, down for two, where they allow some perfusion. The big problem with, with the Reboa is when you deflate it, all of a sudden all that potassium and that acidotic lactate gets dumped into their systems. You know, if you're not ready for it and then pre-treated them, you're probably going to end up with a patient in cardiac arrest. When we get into, after we go from our circulation, we get into our disability. Disability is pretty straightforward as far as we basically, just a quick and dirty, let's get a Glasgow coma scale on the patient, try to kind of get a scale on them. Let's take a look at their pupils, see how they look. But another one good to add in is a dextrin. You know, I usually get, everybody gets at least one dextrose stick just to make sure that hypoglycemia didn't cause their accident or injury. You know, it's panned out. It's, it's a low, low hits, but when it does play out, you know, you know, all of a sudden it's like, all right, I've got somebody with a glucose of, you know, 13 on the table that we need to start worrying about correcting as well as resuscitating. Typically on kids, if they're under about a year, I'm going to be doing them about every 30 minutes because they tend to burn through glucose when you stress them. So those would be times that we would consider um, doing them a little bit more frequently. Based on what you find, anybody who has any alteration in mental status or any pupil abnormality, that could be sluggish pupils, unequal pupils, that could be you know, constricted, dilated, consider a head CT for those folks, just to make sure that one, either they got potentially a head injury as part of their trauma, or that they've got, you know, potentially an anoxic brain injury because of it. So giving them just the benefit of a doubt on that, at least considering it on them so that we, you know, we don't miss anything. After the disability, and one of the things that, you know, if you do think a patient has um, some alteration, or if you think the patient has uh, increased intracranial pressure, one of the quickest and simplest things you can do that doesn't really cost anything is elevate the head of the bed or put them in reverse Trendelenburg. That's something that will, you know, help at least, you know, give you some temporary improvement to this. And so there's a lot of, a lot of value to that. When we start getting into expose and the environment, we really want to, you know, this patient, we need to get them down completely naked. All right, so all clothing's off. You want to kind of look and at least kind of grossly look in all the nooks and crannies. You know, I don't know how many a number of times that, you know, we've been doing this, you know, there's blood all over the patient. All of a sudden you find, you know, an axillary wound, or you find a groin wound. So this is a time when just going over the patients, making sure you can account for where the blood that's there is coming from um, and giving them just kind of a once over the front end, just. Is there anything deformed? Is there anything bleeding? Is there anything that doesn't look, you know, like it, it should? We want to identify those obvious injuries. And if you've got the resources, you can start deploying. It's like, okay, they've got a deformity to their leg. Let's go ahead and get that splinted right now. Um, the big one at the end is providing warming measures. Um, there's three killers in trauma patients. And, you know, hypothermia, is, is a huge portion of that. If you look at in the patients that come in, you know, fairly significant amount of patients that come into the ERs are going to be, you know, they've lost some of their blood volume. Uh, they've been out, even in weather like 80 degrees outside, it's still cooler than what we are. 
It doesn't take, you know, we start kicking in the coagulopathy. Most of these patients, their, their coagulopathies occur at the time of the injury. All of a sudden they develop platelet dysfunction, fibrin, uh, fibrinogen dysfunctions. They start uh, the glycocalyx on the internal inside of the epithelial, the vascular cells. They end up start sloughing off. It's a heparin-like solution. Uh, these things all happen. So we want to keep these patients, you know, really bundled up and warm as much as we can. So try not to, you know, completely uncover them. I, mean, I can still remember years ago, I mean, the patients, you know, laying there spread out in all their glory on the stretcher and, you know, room temperature is probably 70 degrees there. And um, it just wasn't something that was known or addressed at that time. So be aware of it. Try to get your patients. Ideally, there's some, uh, bottom blankets that have the uh, forced hot air that are on them that you can basically slip under the patient and tends to uh, help keep them warm and still allow you to kind of work with them. I tend to try to do it in quadrants, you know, keeping those warm blankets and uh, you want to keep the room warm too. I mean, if you, um, if you get a patient that EMS brings in that if the paramedics not sweating, you know, and especially now in the PPE and COVID worlds, that patient's probably a good chance they're going to be hypothermic. So just uh, things to consider on these, uh, these folks. Once we get past our exposure, then we get finally our full set of vital signs that we can start addressing things on the patient. And a lot of times, this is going to be confirmation. We're, we're already going to have probably treated bolus up until this point. So this gives us some numbers to put along with it that we can start documenting on. But again, our, our skin signs and our pulses are gonna be our friends for that initial phase. You, know, you may go through one or two boluses just based on those. You know, and so you gotta have comfort in your ability to assess those. Next up is making sure we get families in at the bedside, getting those uh, there to start assessing the patient. You know, as they're in there, you know, with their loved ones. I know now with COVID-19, it's, it's hard. I mean, there's limits on visitors and things like that. So, you know, try to, to do the best you can as far as getting families engaged. They're also a good source of, of information. So as we get those folks in there, you know, finding out about those allergies or those problems that, you know, may come back to bite us um, while we're taking care of the patient. Other things is, is thinking about gadgets and give comfort. This is part of your, your trauma assessment of if you haven't already done it, you start thinking about some of the things and a good mnemonic to think about, or remember this by is LMNOP. Okay, so L for labs, your basic trauma panels, your toxicology, your lactates, your BBGs or ABGs, you know, any specific tests that you may want, like in pregnancy, a Kleihauer, I think Betke, when it looks at maternal and fetal mixing of blood. Uh, tox screens. Uh, get them on the monitor if you haven't already got them hooked up on it. Nasooragastric, just again, depending on the fact, are they, is there a head injury? If they're intubated, pretty much everybody intubated really needs an orogastric tube just for decompression. Um, remember in your oxygen capnography, we tend to aim on these patients uh, between 94 and 95%, depending on their condition. So keeping their SATs in that range without, you know, leaving them parked at 100% for, for hours on end, we keep trying to, you know, wean that down more realistic. Making sure we address the pain. Uh, the pain can be something we address, you know, either by pharmacologic where we get orders for fentanyl or ketamine. Ketamine has been one of my favorite drugs just because the, you know, it's got such a good profile as far as with the hemodynamics and a lot of times, if you've also got somebody who's not naive to opiates, they may be on chronic pain meds, this is something that typically they haven't been exposed to before, and you can get um, good pain management from it. Uh, other things that I'm seeing folks do, especially now with more ER providers getting comfortable with ultrasound, is also doing blocks, where they'll do ultrasound blocks to try to relieve the pain, and you, know, you avoid some of the, the side effects of the of opiates with so sometimes you have to be a little bit creative, think out of the box. I, I think we probably don't do as good a job probably managing the pain, a lot of these folks, uh, as we could. So it's something that should be in the back of our minds. 
Once we get that done, you know, then we start getting into our really our secondary. So we start, we're in our H's now. There's two H's. First one is getting a history. Hopefully, you know, you're not having to polygraph your patient um, to get information out of them or the, even worse, the paramedic or EMT. But you want to try to get whatever inf information possible. Look for medical alerts, look in clothing for IDs, pacemaker cards, stent cards. You know, you become a little bit of a detective there trying to figure out what's going on with the patient. Um, other things to look at is, you know, don't forget your, your basic observational skills. Look for pathologies. You know, this person has a barrel chest. They look, you know, you look at their fingers and they've got, you know, cigarette stains on their fingers. You know, you can start thinking some respiratory issues. Um, so, you know, use the other skills that, you know, things that may not jump out at you with it, you know, not related to trauma. These are still things, pathologies, these folks bring uh, with them to uh, the, uh, the room with you. We get into our head to toe. This is where a lot of times, depending on the facility you're in, if you're in a facility where the physician's not in house, if they're having to be called and they're 20 or 30 minutes away, you may be doing the, the full head to toe on these patients. You may be going through it. I've worked in other facilities where it's myself, the ER physician, and tech where, you know, we're doing, we're going through the provider may be doing the airway, I'm assessing breathing, he's assessing circulation, and we're comparing notes as we go. In other cases, you may be, the trauma teams descended upon the person, and you pretty much can't get within probably four or five feet of the patient. So you kind of have to stand back and wait your turn to go through and do an assessment. When we do assessments, for the most part, we go basically head to toe. You know, I, I will make exceptions to that. Sometimes if I've got a child that's not critically ill and doesn't look, you know, toxic in appearance, where I may go, I may start at the feet and kind of let the child warm up to me. I mean, imagine if you're, you know, a child, you're laying there flat on the backboard or a stretcher and some stranger comes and starts running their hands through your hair and everything else. It's, it, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. If the kid's sick, I'm going to do what I have to do. But if the kid is not, it just sometimes helps to, to warm up. So when we get to the head, the face, and the neck, we're gonna start looking, and again, running our gloved hands through the hair, feeling, is there anything there, anything unusual? Is there any blood pooling up behind the head? Uh, is there any unusual looks? You know, does that patient have a very flat looking face? You know, do they possibly have, you know, a Laforte fracture? Uh, could they have other, Trauma. Do you feel any bony deformities or crepitus, especially around uh, the mandible? Uh, are there any, you know, looser missing teeth that you didn't catch earlier? Is there any fluids coming out of anywhere? You know, fluids coming out of the ears, uh, out of the nose, the mouth. You know, are they able to manage their own secretions still? Some things that, you know, in the case of like um, here, battle sign, or I'm sorry, raccoon's eyes, where someone who's had a skull fracture that develops this. You know, it's not going to be something that develops immediately. It's going to be over three or four hours from that point that uh, you'll see potentially if they've had a delayed presentation. Uh, the person on the left there, it's obviously a little, a little bit older. You can start to see the yellowing and green as the hemoglobin breaks down. The one on the right is probably more fresh uh, in that. And again, these patients, you know, going to avoid anything with has to do with an NG tube and everything's going to be an OG tube. Um, the other signs is the one battle signs back in um, posterior to the ear. Just remember that these, the blood is tending, it's going to go based on gravity. So if somebody's been laying some time the whole time since their injury, you may have a case where, if, especially if they've got long hair, you need to pull back the hair and look because the blood, it may be a, uh, it's settled underneath the skin more towards the back than if they've been sitting up the whole time and it's been gravity's pulled it down. One of the reasons we like to avoid like nasopharyngeal airways or uh, NG tubes in this is that, you know, you don't want to be the nurse that, you know, this is your the last view of your NG tube that you just put in. This is a case where I can only imagine that, you know, whenever that was going in, that somebody was, you know, 
pushing it. Maybe it didn't go so easy. So let me push it a little bit harder, you know, get it to make that turn. And all of a sudden, you know, this thing's parked up in there. Um, it's, it's just, you know, think of that nurse pushing the air into it that's going up in there, hooking this person up to suction. It's definitely not, you know, something that, that I want to have, you know, tattooed on my career. So again, if there's any doubt or any possibility, just avoid the nose in these patients. We get to the chest. The chest has got, it's, there's a couple things at the end that we'll see that, you know, basically a lot of the good stuff is locked inside the chest behind uh, the bony rib cage. So we want to make sure that as we assess it, again, we're going to, with the chest, we're going to look, listen, and feel. So we're going to go across the chest. Are there any abnormalities, anything that doesn't look like it should or any problems? From there, uh, we're going to go through and essentially look, touch everything and palpate, listen for what we can hear, bilateral breath sounds while we got our stethoscope on, listen to heart sounds. A couple of problem areas that you want to be aware of is even though this is a, is a bony structure surrounding it, Forces that are applied here. So if you have rib fractures, those same forces have been applied underneath to the lung tissue. And it's very easy to get pulmonary contusions from that. So that, you know, a patient, you can also get it from things like blast lung, but pulmonary contusions can, typically you're gonna see these patients that have been in some injury. They may have had a flail segment or they may have multiple broken ribs. And over a period of time, they may initially you know, be satting really well for you. And then over a period of time, their sats may start dropping from that, you know, taking more oxygen to try to maintain a sat of 94 or greater. And so keep that in mind as you, you know, pulmonary contusion is something, even though, you know, they may not have been fractured ribs in this area, but uh, it's also the case with it that that underlying tissue could have been bruised and damaged. Some problem injuries that you'll see is any, Anytime you see somebody with a fracture to their sternum, that's always a red flag for me because it takes a lot of force to break the sternum. Um, also, if you have first or second rib fractures, first ribs hidden right up underneath your collar, your clavicle. And so it takes a lot of force to break that. And a lot of times if you do, you're, you're gonna have other injuries that are associated with it. Um, beyond the bony structure, outside, you also have to worry about the, the soft and gooey stuff inside. You take some patients, in this case, you've got a patient with, you know, a left pneumothorax that's probably headed towards a tension because you're already seeing, you know, the difference between a pneumothorax and a tension pneumothorax is basically your tension pneumothorax when your hemodynamics start getting affected. So if I just have a pneumothorax, my heart rate's probably going to go up. My sat may come down a little bit. My blood pressure may be a little up or down, depending on the size of it. When I start getting attention in the thorax, then my hemodynamics are affected and my blood pressure starts falling. So that's a true, you know, life-threatening emergency that, you know, needs to be addressed. It's not, you know, the time for somebody to do a chest x-ray. It's really the time for your providers to uh, potentially get, you know, get a chest tube in, but if they're acutely ill and falling pressures, it's probably do a pleural uh, needle decompression of the chest. We'll see here that, I mean, that's the amount of lung volume that's lost in this patient. So all that oxygenation, respiration ability is gone. That lung's collapsed. And so basically they're breathing essentially off of one lung. This is one, the opposite side, you can actually see the visceral pleura over here and the parietal pleura, you can see the dark little the shaded line there, you see all the vascular markings over in this area. And then over here, you really see no vascular markings. So, you know, that's a, a nice pneumothorax that they've developed. There's a little bit of shift maybe over into the heart, but it's probably, you know, not affecting the hemodynamics. You know, it's not as, as large of a size. One of the, uh, the pictures or the videos I've ran across of somebody with a really, um, nasty, it's, it's kind of a double whammy of a flail chest. It's not only a flail segment of the chest, but it's the flail sternum. Um, this is one that, you know, if you look at the injury, you pretty much expect this person probably has uh, probably pulmonary contusions, but they also probably have pretty nasty cardiac contusions. I'm 
I'm not exactly sure why they're giving this person a nebulizer. If that's me, I'm kind of hoping that nebulizer's got ketamine or fentanyl in it. That just looks painful. So this is another, you know, if we look at, you know, for things that can affect our circulatory system, these are uh, obstructive shocks. In this case, we've got, this is an echo that's being done, probes up here on the chest. This is a four chamber view. So this is the right atrium right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. You see that this black area, anechoic, is around. This is basically fluid that's built up, blood around the heart. That becomes problematic because typically in your, in your patients with pericardial effusions, they can accommodate. I've heard of patients having a liter or a liter and a half of fluid drained off of them from a pericardial effusion. Pericardial tamponade kills you because it accumulates so quickly. That effusion may not have, a, you know, may have taken several days to a week to accumulate. Tamponade is going to occur over minutes. This is actually the next video is one of a dissection of a heart. You'll see that there's a through and through uh, wound to the heart in one side, out the other. They're, when they remove and they're going to cut through the pericardial sac first, but the amount of blood that's there, there's only about probably 200 cc's of the mice of this person. So it's kind of an interesting little quick video, just seeing the, the blood and how little it takes to, uh, to basically kill someone. This is a pericardial sac right there, and there's a clot. Normally the, the sac adheres, there's about 30 to 50 cc's of a lubricant fluid that's between the sac and the uh, heart muscle. The heart's typically about the size of your fist and that lubricates it. So there's one of the wounds and then they flip the heart up. You'll see the other wound in a second. And that's about 200, 250 cc's of blood, but it accumulates so quickly that the heart, there's no time for the heart to, comp to uh, compensate for it. When we look at the reason being, if you look at on this heart, this uh, through and through. Look at how small this right ventricle is on the heart. So basically this right ventricle is basically, it collapses very easy. So it doesn't take a lot of um, pressure on the heart to basically collapse that. And if blood doesn't get through this side, it doesn't get out the other. I'm gonna take just a quick, about a five minute break to give everybody a chance for refreshing and make pot and breaks and everything real quick. And we'll get started back uh, with abdominal and flanks just in a second.
All right, and we'll get ready, get going probably in about another minute. If anybody has questions, you can, um, we'll have a quick question and answer. We're about, um, only about 10 or 15 more slides to go on this. and We will uh, go to questions and then uh, as soon as the we get the video and all edited, we'll make sure that we get um, links out to everybody so that uh, if you want to go back and for some reason rewatch it or share it or somebody wasn't able to be here for it. The folks that are back, it's, it always amazes me. I did a number of years in cardiac electrophysiology and just some of the heart, you know, the, the intricate parts of it. You know, if you look at the intraventricular septum, you know, the, the size of it and also the outer wall, the free wall of the uh, left ventricle, as you look at the right ventricle, it's almost just kind of piggybacked on this. But, you know, as powerful as the left side of the heart is, if blood doesn't make it through the right ventricle. So if I've got external pressures out here on the right ventricle, then it's what ends up happening is that every time the, the heart squeezes, fine, but every time it relaxes, it's not able to accept the flow of blood in. So every time, instead of, you know, it may relax and all of a sudden, you know, 50 cc's of blood gets in, it squeezes. Next time, you know, that pressure's increased, only 49 cc's of blood gets in next time. So it's kind of a restrictive thing where the squeeze is good. It's just, um, you end up um, with this, this, as the squeeze goes in, you know, it's just that relaxation period. All right, let us get started to the next section. When we go into the abdomen and the flanks, this is another area where that we want to basically, uh, again, part of the assessment, this lends itself really well to look, listen, and feel. So when we look at the abdomen, look for abnormalities. Anything, is there seatbelt signs? Are there, is there bruising that sticks out? You know, is there anything that looks out of the way? You know, is there symmetry there? Um, is there any place that you palpate that um, elicits pain? In some cases, you may have an unresponsive patient that you really can't, you know, they can't respond to you, but you know, does anything feel out of the ordinary? Uh, this is especially true, you know, when we look at the abdomen, we may have to, in the pregnant female, we may have to address the abdomen earlier versus later. Uh, when they get to a point where they're 20 weeks of, of pregnancy, um, they get something known as aortic cable compression syndrome. And what happens with that is that the baby is laying essentially on the inferior vena cava and the aorta. So it cuts down on venous return, as well as cardiac output. Um, I do a class, it's basically it's the ACLS class, but it's oriented towards OB providers where we teach, uh, basically you go through, get the same ACLS card, but it's with scenarios that are around the pregnant female. Um, with that, several things come into play is that, that baby at that size, when you have to think about mom, you know, not just as a trauma patient, but if mom's in cardiac arrest, you know, you honestly need three people to do compressions and, and uh, CPR. You need one person just holding the, the baby off, uh, reaching around mom's belly and pulling it over off to the left side while somebody else is ventilating and doing compression. So it becomes a three person endeavor. Um, the pregnant female also is at a high risk for aspiration due to high circulating progesterone levels. Um, they tend not to like, you know, laying flat on their back by any means, um, just based on the pressure. Um, one of the things to try to, um, you know, in the cardiac arrest world, you know, we don't teach, I, I run scenarios occasionally on this when I go into ERs doing consulting. And, you know, one of the scenarios is, probably the nightmare for most ERs is the OB arrest, where somebody who's, you know, essentially if mom is 20 weeks or greater and she goes into cardiac arrest, the guidelines, you know, have high, you know, have evidence for the fact that um, you need to be starting, the provider needs to be starting doing a perimortem C-section, which 
four minutes from the time mom goes down, baby needs to be out when the, when the clock hits five minutes. So that's kind of a scary scenario because you basically are, um, in this case, you're doing this in the ER. It's not, you know, call the OB, let's get them to OR. It's some, you know, shaking hand ER physician taking a number 10 scalpel blade, making an incision from sternum to symphys pubis. So um, there's some interesting, the Heart Association has an interesting white paper out on it. It's special circumstance arrest, and it's all the stuff over the years we've stripped out of uh, ACLS and PALS about resuscitating, you know, the, the hypothermic patient, the drowning patient tops, and the pregnant is one of those. So things you can look, as you look, listen, and feel, um, some things that you can see, this is one that, that you may very well see. Um, it's not going to be uh, both of these bruising signs are not ones that you'll see immediately. It's going to take three, four hours or more to, to develop. Uh, the one here that you're seeing is Cullen sign. It's basically uh, periumbilical bruising, and it's basically uh, intraperitoneal blood. You can also see this with really bad cases of pancreatitis, hemorrhagic pancreatitis, but these patients in those cases are really super, super sick. One other sign you may see is Gray's Turner sign, which is bruising on the flanks. Normally, it's from if you feel on your ribs, it's from the starts below the lower costal margin of the rib on the lateral side, and you'll normally find it between the lower rib and the uh, iliac crest. So it's basically in there, and that's going to indicate somebody with a uh, basically a retroperitoneal bleed. So it would be one that would be um, kind of highlighting that. When we get into assessing the pelvis, the pelvis is an interesting um, organ. Again, we're going to basically with it, we're going to uh, look and feel it. You know, I usually when I'm doing a pelvic assessment on a patient with trauma, I have a five-step process that I use. First of all, I look at the pelvis. Is there any abnormalities, bruising, swelling, hematomas, or anything else that gets my attention? Uh, number two is I do something, close the book. So I basically, we're afraid in that case of someone with an open book pelvic fracture. So if that's the case, you would gently try to close the book on the iliac crest on the outsides. Okay, that's step two. Step three is gentle downward pressure on the uh, uh, iliac crest. And then uh, step four is pressure over the symphys pubis. Step five is look and see, is there any blood at the urinary meatus? So those five steps. At any part of those palpation steps, if you feel instability, you immediately stop what you're doing and you put a pelvic binder on this person. Um, pelvic injuries are really, it's such a large bone and it takes so much force and energy to break it that it becomes very much, you know, that you're going to have other kind of collateral damage if this happens. So, you know, just being aware of that, uh, that make you suspicious for other things. Very rarely does somebody have just an isolated uh, pelvic injury. Sometimes the mechanism of the injury will, will kind of give you, if the person is sitting with their pelvis in their sports car and they're wedged between, you know, the console and the door, T-bone impact ends up, you know, break it iliac crest can do other damage. Just like if somebody has, you know, an object that falls upon them, anterior posterior pressure, you know, it can cause injuries. The big one we worry about is that um, the open book pelvic fracture. Pelvis doesn't get fractured that often. I think it's responsible for about 3% of skeletal bone fractures. But if somebody does have a pelvic fracture, there's between a 15 and 20% mortality rate they have an open pelvic fracture, that number goes up to 50%. So an open pelvic fracture, and you basically kind of a coin flip whether you live or die. This is what I found on, on Facebook. It was kind of interesting in that, uh, I don't know if anybody ever rides with their feet up on the dashboard. Hopefully after this, you'll decide not to. This is somebody that basically was riding with their feet up on the dashboard, I think is from what I heard the story is. And, you know, it, that just kind of, that, can't even imagine those, that injury. Um, and you imagine also 
this person was on some sort of anticoagulation, that's pretty much a non-survivable injury. When we talk about uh, patients that we end up, you know, putting a pelvic binder on, there's a little bit of Goldilocks associated with it. When we do the pelvic binder, we basically want to put the binder right over the femoral heads of the trochanter there. Um, it's, it's kind of, if it looks like that it's too, um, it looks like it's too low, it's probably almost in the right position. Um, a lot of times people put it over the iliac crest and they compress it there, which is, is too high up. Or, you know, they'll put it down below the head of the femur, you know, too low in that case. You really want it right over um, the socket where the femur's at and basically just pulling in. There's a couple of different ones out there. The Sam Sling is one that's nice um, as far as it has a uh, belt system on it so that as soon as you put 20 pounds of pressure, it clicks so that you know that you've hit the right amount. Uh, the downside is if I'm carrying it in my kit, I've got to carry three or four of them for the different sizes. There's another one out, the T-Pod, that is a single size, but it doesn't really tell you. You kind of have to guesstimate a little bit as far as how much pressure to put on it. Um, all these devices, no matter if you're using a sheet, the T-Pod, or a Sam Sling, you need to put it directly on the skin. You don't want to trap any... Um, seams or rivets from blue jeans, other things like that, you end up causing um, ulcerations and all kind of badness. So just definitely try to, you know, this is one of the big reasons under the exposure, try to get the person stripped down um, completely um, and then apply these things over it. When we get to the upper and lower extremities, um, the thing with your upper and lower extremities in assessment is that you really want to, we're kind of focused on the box. And that's where a lot of the badness happens. Your extremities, if they're not having exsanguinating hemorrhage, um, then I'm going to note those and I'm going to try to do whatever I can. But, you know, these won't be the things that typically are going to kill you in the acute phase. It's typically going to be something in the trunk section you know, neck and head of the body that's going to cause you, you know, your demise. So we try to address these. Again, if they're bleeding, we're going to tourniquet them. We're going to put pressure on them. We're going to put splints on them. All type, all those type of things. When we're assessing them, remember that if you've intubated the patient, you know, your, um, your uh, sensation and your motor is going to end up being deferred. So really all you've got left is you know, skin color, temperature, moisture, and feeling for pulses. So that's going to be kind of a limit, but still you can do a lot of good as far as by, you know, splinting the extremities, elevating them as appropriate. Um, those are all things that will, will help that patient in their recovery. The last part that we haven't looked at is don't forget to check the backside. And that's one of the things that, you know, we tend to we're going to end up log rolling the patients. Um, if there's no indication there's a cervical injury or a pelvic fracture, and that's something new that like in the ENA has came out with, I believe the um, advanced trauma life support physician takes, I think they're going to end up probably switch into that. They haven't yet, but it's just something that, you know, you want to make sure you look at the backside, make sure there's no pooling of blood. There's no, um, other injuries, it's a good time too to try to maximize your, your efficiency is um, get anything out from under the patient. I mean, I found rocks, broken glass, gravel, syringes, any number of things. So uh, remember those. The last few things, I've got just a few um, miscellaneous stuff that really didn't fit. You know, I told you that I enjoy doing cadaver labs. This is a good, this is a uh, clamshell thoracotomy from one of the cadaver labs that I did. And this is basically, um, if you'll notice in there, as soon as, and this is kind of the concept behind pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax, if you look in here, the lung is all collapsed on the posterior aspect. As long as that chest is sealed, the lung is held up against the, um, 
visceral pleura is held up against the parietal pleura just by a little bit of surfactant, a little bit of lubricant to let them slide, uh, and surface tension. But you break that system, and all of a sudden, that'll collapse to the very back of, um, of the cadaver. So, you know, or the patient, if they're, in this case, an injury from trauma. So it's a good indication, really, in the center, there's only a little bit of mediastinal tissue up here that really keeps this together. This is all held basically by surface tension. You've got the heart here. You've got the other side of the lungs there. You can see that also look at the thickness of the chest wall. When you start thinking about this is one of the reasons that if we're doing pleural decompressions on patients, you know, the least, the smallest needle that probably will be able to hit it is something that, you know, three and a quarter and ideally four inches plus, because that's a lot of tissue to go through, especially. This would be called, this would be a clamshell thoracotomy, and this would basically give, if there was penetrating trauma in here, this would give the surgeon access to all these areas that they could start doing repairs on. The next one's a video of, um, um, and it's from my alma mater, the Medical College of Georgia, and it's from a gentleman there, Larry Melnick. And it's basically, it's an open thoracotomy of a motorcycle uh, accident. Open thoracotomies do best if they're done with penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds, knifings, things like that. Blunt trauma, they don't tend to do as well because of the fact that a lot of times if you've had great disruption in the vessels there, when you open up, there's just going to be a massive exsanguination of blood volume onto the pulse. So this is a fairly, uh, you can find this video out on uh, YouTube also. Larry Melnick posts a lot of stuff. He's got his own web, web channel there. And this is probably, uh, you can tell it's a little bit old. It's probably late 80s, early 90s because the only PPE, I mean, they're up to their elbows in this gentleman's motorcycle accident's chest, and the only thing they're wearing is basically uh, surgical gloves. You'll notice there's a number of angia casts in this gentleman's chest where they decompressed him. tracheal deviation to the left. They got about 200 cc's of blood out of his uh, uh, left chest, his right chest, sorry. Fake plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we just don't have enough. A lot of times these patients, and in this case, the CPR is probably not, didn't do anything to help this patient because they had no, no liquid in the tank. So, unfortunately, a lot of times on this, uh, we treat them a little bit like they're a, an ACLS patient, when in reality, um, I tend to try to avoid the chest because you're just making it harder for the person with the sharp objects. And so the real cure for this person is the, the chest compressions probably aren't doing a whole lot for this patient. It's going to be somebody getting into that chest cavity and either redirecting something, patching something, or draining something. 
that's going to help that patient survive. A lot of times you'll see these patients in, they'll go into a PEA arrest and it's, they just don't have enough circulating volume to be able to, um, there's to generate a palpable pressure. So that would be one that, um, you know, get them in there and get it as quick as possible. And that's, it's hard in a lot of facilities. You'll see a lot of outlying facilities not doing this just because if they do get in there and crack the chest and save them, what are they going to do with them at that point? You know, they may have just a general surgeon that, you know, has the last time he was in somebody's chest was, you know, back in uh, residence. Um, what's next? Um, some of the things that what I would encourage, and I, I encourage all the, the folks that are in classes that I do is make a, make a commitment to yourself as far as, you know, we've got on the website, there's resources listed for a podcast, uh, some of the best medical podcasts that I've been able to find, uh, websites, um, resources. So, I mean, feel free to use those as resources to help. You really have to kind of make a commitment to, you know, I, I commit every day that I'm going to spend an hour self-educating. And you do that and it starts, it'll start having an impact. All of a sudden, you know, you'll see it in your practice and you'll see it in, you know, the work. You'll, you'll become more a resource if you're not already uh, for people that, you know, that are looking for knowledge. So I would, you know, encourage you to make that commitment and do it um, and just stick with it. Podcast, you know, I've got long drives sometimes that I can get an hour podcast in or I've got time that I'm just, you know, killing. I've got, you know, materials that websites that I've saved that I can go read articles. And again, Twitter, if you're, if you're not on Twitter, I would, it's, it's kind of, it is part of social media, but it's not like being on Facebook where, you know, you've got to worry about what your, you know, your drunk uncle Bob's going to do at three in the morning, you know, on camera with his shirt off or something. So you, it's, you get a lot of good education on it and a lot of good resources. Um, from here, it's, uh, it's questions. If anybody has any questions, um, happy to take them. If I've got the answer, I'll, I'll definitely give it. Or if, um, I don't. I'll try to find. I can definitely look to find it. Hopefully, this was a good experience for everybody. And again, it's just a taste. We're we're trying to do more of these, um, just to you know try to give back a little bit as far as the getting people interested in you know trauma education, uh, stop the bleed, things like that. Anybody has any uh, other stuff, this is my contact information. So feel free to snapshot a picture of that. Um, if you have any friends that are looking for uh, TN, virtual TNCC classes, we're running about three to five of those a week right now. Um, this is, um, we're doing them and we're expanding. We're also adding the ENPC classes. So um, we've got the, uh, EKG program that we're coming out with where we'll be starting doing some pretty basic stuff. And then if you want to come study some more advanced stuff, we'll be happy to, to get you signed up. All right, I'll be hanging around for a few more minutes if there's any, um, if there's any questions, definitely email or send them to me. Um, kind of reading the chat list as we go. And thanks everybody for coming out. I appreciate it. And um, hopefully I'll be seeing you again at other programs that we put on. The video, I will have it posted. We've had some problems with Facebook Live, but I'll have it posted um, 
and we'll get it posted up to the website as soon as possible. I'll have to do a little bit of editing to get it on. We have, uh, for the person asking questions on the TNCC, we've, we're doing about three to six classes every week right now. We were before COVID doing about 40 to 50 a year and we've kind of accelerated. So um, this is, um, we have classes, uh, typically we recommend folks try to get into a class and we've got openings about 30 days out. That gives you time to get your book. Um, and be able to uh, study and everything to prepare for it. And we've got all of our instructors, the course directors are um, advanced degrees, master's level with real world experience. So it's not somebody who really, um, um, you know, sits behind a desk all day and doesn't, you know, just teaches. These are folks that, you know, have real world experiences. Five steps on the pelvic assessment, on the uh, doing the pelvic assessment is one, observe the uh, pelvis, look for any areas of deformity, bruising, swollen areas, uh, anything that looks asymmetrical. Step two on that is to put your hands on either side of the butt cheeks and close, as you're looking at the pelvis, close the book on it. So you're looking in an open book pelvic fracture, the pelvis is kind of splayed wide open. So in closing it, that's the second step. Then you press gently on the iliac crest. Third is press gently on the uh, symphys pubis is the next. And then lastly, the fifth step is look at the perineum. A lot of times if you've got pelvic injuries, you, you may have bladder um, or urethral injuries that you'd wanna be looking there to make sure you didn't have blood at the meatus, which would pretty much eliminate um, probably would not want to put a foley in. I believe the ENA does have for Melissa that uh, there are some practice questions out there. The ENA also, there's a workbook that you can get that it's, it has value for some students on it, depending on their learning style, that the workbook where they can go in and kind of fill out some things. Um, we provide pretty much everything that the student you know, would need in the class. You're, when you go through the TNCC course for that, the TNCC course really is about getting the trauma nursing process. So going through essentially most of what I went through today and going through and being able to demonstrate that. So by coming, when you come in, ideally you'd be able to write out your entire TNC or TNP process from scratch um, and you'd have a good idea of kind of the flow and the interventions. The way that the new eighth edition is done is that you, um, your written test happens after the course. So as soon as the final day of the course, we put in your skills test uh, scores, and then that generates an email to you with a link and you do your test in the seven days following um, the course, which has been that way since long before COVID uh, started early last year. Um, we do all the things, everything is done on video conference, just like this, where we create a breakout room for testing and we go in, we get a scenario and you basically talk or demonstrate your way. Some of the students um, in doing it have found creative ways. I had one student the other day that she had one of the powder puff girls was her patient on the floor. and She had Elmo um, holding cervical traction. So people have came up with pretty interesting ways to be able to do it. Um, the, uh, the big thing on it is just having, you know, typically the way we 
we test somebody is when you come into the testing for the skill station, I give you a couple of minutes to write down your trauma nursing process. That's a reference for you to work from so that as you go through, you know, that you've got something reversed, like, okay, I've got my A done, now I move to my B. And it just gives you a visual reference. Um, from there, you get a scenario flashed up on the screen, just like on the PowerPoint here, gives you a patient, a scenario, and you just walk through it. You know, I prepare my room, get my warmer, prepare, you know, my, get my team in PPE. I go ahead and um, get some warm fluid set up. I have blood handy, you know, any specialty equipment. Then patients rolling in the door, you do your across the room. Is there any uncontrolled external hemorrhage? If there's not, um, you go straight into your AFPU, what's their response level like? You maintain C-spine control, open mouth, look in. You need to name four things that you look for at least, and then we will give you, you know, the rest of whatever we have. Um, you treat things as you find them. So if you find snoring, you put an oropharyngeal airway in. If you get gurgling, you suction them. From there, you know, once you've fixed and done everything from A, you move to B. When you get to B, breathing, look, listen, and feel. You address anything, basically, are they in distress or failure? Oxygen versus um, an AMBU bag. From there, your disability, uh, look at your Glasgow Coma Scale, your pupils, throw a dextrose in for good measure. Uh, any alteration in mental status or pupils, buys them a CT scan. Uh, you go to exposure next. When you get into exposure, um, um, they end up uh, basically uncover the patient, and look for uncontrolled external hemorrhage, any obvious injuries, and then rewarm the patient. Uh, after exposure, and the for Chelsea, we've actually had students that do, they, they've liked it. It all depends on the learning style of the student. We've had some people that say it's a lot more intimate. I mean, it's like this type of an environment where, you know, typically we're only doing, per course director, we're doing six students. Um, we're starting to expand it, but we're bringing in a diff, another instructor to help with some of the breakout sessions. So it's, it's fairly small courses. I mean, I've done courses that we've had 40 and 50 people there where, you know, you barely know anybody's name. And with this setting, I mean, you know, we're in front of the computer looking at each other for, you know, typically the first day is about nine hours. The second day is about seven. And um, it becomes a little bit more intimate. You know, you feel like you're, you're kind of got a one-on-one -on -one session with the instructor. Uh, or the hands-on test is, is really just like, you know, we've had to adapt some of the things that we do for TNCC and ENPC, where in the past we would, one of the activities is an airway one, where I'd give you sheets that you would teach back to the class. Well, now I email you those sheets when we do the class and um, you end up, um, as we go through it, you kind of follow along. Some of the other activities, there's a head injury uh, and a tr thoracic trauma activity where you get the sheets. It's kind of like bingo where we go through and I put an image up on the screen and you tell me what number goes along with it. Uh, there's the shock exercises where you get basically uh, four pages, one for each type of shock. And then from there, we end up, you know, uh, you go through and fill out, you know, this is what the blood pressure would do. This is what my respiratory, this is what my um, heart rate would do. Here's what my preload, afterload, and my contractility. And from there, uh, we compare notes as everybody comes back. On day two, we do a trauma jeopardy. And a lot of it is around, um, some of the things that you're gonna see on your written test at the end, things like axial loading, uh, aortic cable compression, um, certain injury patterns. So those would be things that uh, we would cover in the, the trauma jeopardy. And uh, the day two is pretty much a, it's all the core materials, all the hardcore stuff is on day one of the TNCC course. On so day two is a little bit lighter, the psychosocial, there's, um, surface and burn trauma, there's see, disaster and transitions of care. Once we finish that, then we go straight into testing.
We've actually, somebody had asked about how the students did. We actually have seen scores improve um, on the, um, both the written and on the skill sessions. I mean, I think some of that is we do, we do a lot of upfront work with the materials we send out that we've developed to help you prepare for the class. But I also think that, you know, the folks that, um, people come into it maybe a little bit better prepared because they realize it is virtual and, you know, there's not a lot of places to hide on the screen. So people tend to do that. Um, for Melissa, the virtual hands-on, the, um, on day one, we will do typically on the, uh, we'll do six scenarios of practice. So each of the six students will have at least, you know, have one scenario that they'll go through and it's kind of like a warm up. They're more complicated than typically the assessment of skills test that we do on day two, because on day one, you may get a pediatric patient, you may get an OB patient, uh, you may get a far more complicated patient. So the, there's no, when we do the, they're kind of learning scenarios. So it's people end up, um, for the learning ones, it kind of puts you through your paces a little bit, but you still have your team around you to pull from. Um, when you get to day two, it's a fairly straightforward assessment. Like on, on day one, you'll, you'll go through and again, you'll, you may have a pregnant patient who is um, one of the scenarios that we go through. And so you'll have to think about, you know, the aortic cable compression, tipping the patient over or having somebody manually, you know, displace the uterus. Um, on the day two, when we do the testing, it's, it's really straightforward. There's no, you know, it's, it, they're not, I wouldn't consider them even major traumas. You know, they're not beaten, banged up beyond all recognition. Um, we will be posting the um, um, video as soon as I have a chance to edit and make sure it's, uh, I've got to look, we've had problems because we've, on some of the, the videos that we've done, just the fact of the, I don't know if it's the system's resources or what. I know that we were live casting on Facebook and I think after about an hour, that seemed like it cut out. So I'll try to send a follow-up email around to everybody. And again, if there's any specific information that you need um, as far as around the classes that we do, I mean, feel free to email me uh, before that. Um, as soon as you finish the TNCC class and you've successfully completed the skill station, we have to enter your scores into the ENA system. And once those are in and we finalize the class, usually it's done within about an hour or so of the end of the class on day two, you get the email. And so when you get the email, you have seven days after that to do the written test. Um, if for some reason it is an open book test, if for some reason, there's a hiccup or something and you, you know, you're not, not successful with passing it on the first go around. Um, you have within that same seven day window, one more opportunity. So they remediate you, uh, show you the answers you got right, show you the answers you got wrong, and then you can come back in and have one more attempt at it. After that second attempt, um, you end up, you'd have to repeat the whole course in that. And we've been, um, We've been lucky we haven't had that occur. So that's, we, we try to do a really good job preparing stuff. You know, we don't feed you the questions or the answers, but we make sure that, you know, you've got the best possible preparation that, and, you know, making sure that you, you go through the book, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. There's a lot more moving parts than just doing ACLS. I know people that show AC, come up with ACLS, you know, cold and kind of plan on, you know, passing. This is one that you really need to do some preparation. There's required online modules that you now have to complete before you can be allowed at entrance into the class on day one. So it's not a lot of stuff. It's about maybe um, two and a half, three hours. Uh, I think for Melissa, I think the ENA, the website, I think the ENA has some practice questions on the website. I'd have to go back and look. They've changed some things around on it, but I think that. Um, they have some practice questions there. 
that you can go through. And during the class, we there's a lot of questions, interactive stuff built in. Um, when you do the pre-course modules, which again is about three and a half hours, that covers the trauma nursing assessment, uh, bariatric, geriatric, pregnant, um, interpersonal violence, and pediatrics. So you hit those modules there. And we, we cover the important part of those modules on day one. We kind of go back and highlight some of the areas that you probably want to look at. 